Welcome to this uh, Train the Trainer training, how to optimize fireline education in a virtual environment. Um, this is co-hosted by the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange and the Northeastern Forest Fire Protection Compact. Let me go over our goals for the workshops, um, and then I'll go over the agenda, uh, what we're actually going to be doing today. So we wanted to introduce you to, not train you thoroughly in, but introduce you to some best practices for optimizing NWCG courses specifically for digital learning. Um, we wanted to teach you some of the logistical and technical aspects of managing a digital course, um, which we've already had to deal with some of the technical challenges this morning. Um, we want to help you come up with an action plan for how to optimize your own course to a digital environment. And again, we're not going to be able to do all of that for everybody in three hours, but we're available and we're happy to help. So if you want to follow up with us, we're happy to do that. Today, our, what we're going to do, we have kind of, uh, we have four uh, half hour-ish blocks with breaks built in. Um, in the first section, we're going to start big. We're going to go over some of the fundamentals of virtual teaching and learning. Um, so we're going to start with kind of big picture stuff, not specific to NWCG. Then we're going to zoom in a little bit and uh, introduce some adaptations and best practices for fireline teaching. And this is going to be engaging. So uh, you can't just hide um, with your camera off the whole time. So we really do want you to stay engaged and interact and ask questions as you have them. Um, then we're going to have homework for half an hour. You are going to need to uh, to come up with an activity that teaches a unit of a specific NWCG course in a small group. We're going to do that today. And then uh, we're going to report out. So you'll also have practice doing the homework that you would be asking your students to do. And you'll also have practice reporting out and then sharing feedback on how that medium that you tried to use, how did that work for you? What are some things that you can learn about how that could work for that specific activity, for other activities, for other, you know, other units that you might need to teach? Again, thank you very much for being here. We're going to dive right in. So um, one of the first features that we find is very handy in, uh, in Zoom um, is the polling feature. So um, one poll that I prepared for you is how prepared were you for class today? And uh, I could have done a better job technically in getting everybody set up, but you should see a poll on your screen. Um, please note that you'll need to scroll down to see all of the options. Um, and again, uh, in the pre-reading, you saw Virginia had sent out a, a checklist for students. So you can expect your students, just like we're asking you to be prepared, um, to fulfill all of these options. So uh, please fill out this poll, and I'll, I'll stop talking so you can read all the options, but they should look familiar to you. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'll talk lightly over this, actually. Um, so what I see as the host in, in Zoom um, is I, I can see the answers that are coming in. I don't see who is saying what, but I will be able to share the poll results so everybody can see uh, in a bar graph form uh, how many people have no distractions, <laughs> et cetera. Um, so I'll be able to share those results soon. Um, in Zoom, it's good to prepare your poll ahead of time, and you can use a poll like a quiz. You can make it multiple choice. You can just have uh, two answers you know, where they have to choose one or the other. Um, so in this one, I set it up as check all that apply. So this could be a good teaching tool for some of the, some of the elements that you have. Um, and again, we're doing this right at the beginning. So you can also surprise your students by forcing them to engage early on. I can see that 11 of 14 people have, uh, have voted. Um, 12 of 14 people have voted. I'm going to give you a 10 second countdown. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. All right. End polling, and I'm going to share the results. Um, Scott, thank you for the, uh, the heads up on your dog wandering in to show you about the dirty socks. My dog is too tired to share my dirty socks. But all right. So hopefully you can see the poll results here. So um, most of us have a reliable internet connection, but there are people that do not. So your students, similarly, might not have a reliable internet connection. That's something to be aware of. No distractions. Mm. Uh, yeah, 38% have no distractions. That means the majority of us have challenges that we're living with in the workplace, in our workplace environment today. About half of us have an appropriate background. Uh, we'll have some discussions about that uh, later. Um, and uh, oh, most of you tested your audio device before class and confirmed that it's working. That is an excellent move. And as I mentioned to some of you, I dialed it on my phone just in case my computer wigs out today. Um, so that's another preparatory step you could take. My face is well lit and visible to the camera. Um, 
most of you that's the case. Um, I'm a little, a little too bright today, but that's okay. Um, most of you came prepared to introduce yourself and fully participate. We really appreciate that. Um, less than half of you brought all the necessary physical materials uh, per the teacher's instructions. So um, that's okay. We're uh, doing what we can um, in this environment, but be aware that your students might not be prepared or what are some steps you can take to make sure that your students are more fully prepared. So communicating ahead of time that you're going to be teaching a chainsaw unit today. Uh, you know, we could, maybe we can do a better job of that or just be understanding if your students aren't able to read and process emails and come completely prepared. Um, people that are wearing an agency or organization shirt or other professional attire uh, in this, this Zoom day and age, it's harder to remain uh, in a totally professional setting, but little things like wearing your agency shirt can help with that when you're in a Zoom setting like this. Um, Folks, most folks sign in the class early uh, to troubleshoot any last minute difficulties. Uh, and sorry for folks that uh, did have difficulties uh, at our end. Um, let's see. And uh, so most of you, but not all, have set aside all other work and projects for the duration of the class, just as if we were meeting face to face. So um, as you know, as an instructor, it is incredibly distracting if you have students who are checking their phones, except in case of emergency or dealing with email or otherwise you know, not having their attention where it needs to be. So thank you for filling out the student poll. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, and so be prepared. And when you're thinking about how your students are preparing, um, think about where they're coming from and what do you need to do to set expectations so that they will be really good students for you. And uh, what do you need to do as an instructor to accommodate uh, needs in, during a pandemic in a virtual learning situation? Um, but just be aware of where your students are coming from and uh, do your best to adapt and take it in stride. So I just shared one form of polling. Uh, Dave has another form of polling to share. Ready, Dave? And Dave, Dave is here. On. Now we can hear you. Okay, so my name is Dave Crary. There's a polling where I can ask everybody, how many people live east of the Mississippi River? Okay, I'm seeing some hands, but I'm not seeing 100% compliance. How many people live west of the Mississippi River? Okay, so I see Scott and uh, Zeng Zillinger didn't check his thing there, but how can that help me? Well, if I preset people up and I Dave, we lost you. If I had, I forget where you lost me. So there were two people west of Mississippi and the rest of the east. There's a polling that if you prep your students to have cards, and I usually do three of them, A, B, and C, I could say, how many people are live east of the Mississippi? Hold up an A, and everyone has to hold it up. Some people already have it. And if you're west, do B. And if you hold this up, you don't have to do the math there, but the people who are visually seeing can, can get, can see that whole thing there. So uh, the idea is if this works, which I have a feeling it's not going to, but yeah, it's not working quite right. Unless you can see the A, B, and C. We can. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, that was part of my PowerPoint, but then Amanda said we weren't doing them, so. I stopped. Okay, so that's another type of polling. Hands work A, B, and C work better. I've used it successfully in the month of June. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, and as David pointed out, um, using a, using the polling with you know, a card is a, it's a tactile thing you can do that just keeps it more engaging than just pushing buttons. So, um, oh, a quick note: uh, holding up something. Uh, means that it might, it might look flipped backwards to you. That's not a good example of an A because you can do a mirror image. Uh, to me, it looks backwards, but to you, it looks forward. So that's just a small, small item to be aware of. All right. Um, do other folks have suggestions for polling uh, type activities or other kind of participant centered activities that, that, you, that you like to do or that you tried before in, in a virtual setting? Amanda, one of the things that I've been doing is just as in a regular classroom, 
um, we call roll and ask people to introduce themselves uh, in person. Yeah, thank you, Matt. That's a great suggestion. We often do that, and I apologize. I was a little distracted by our actual extra technical hiccups this morning um, as we got signed in. I realized I also neglected to allow our instructors to introduce themselves, too. Um, so I think for Ben and Virginia and Dave uh, and Jack who's helping us out as well, um, when, you, when we come to your turn in the agenda, if you're willing to just take a brief moment and uh, introduce yourself, um, that would be good. Um, but we're all here to learn from each other, too, so, because we're all trying to instruct and do what we can. Um, I do want to point out that we're getting some good dialogue in the, uh, in the chat window. So um, the chat window will we'll actually mention that. Oh, I was going to mention that right now, actually. So the chat window can be a handy place to, to save information. Sometimes people, um, some people feel more comfortable typing than they do saying something out loud, depending on distractions or just how they process information. Um, but the nice thing is that in Zoom, you can save the chat window. So if you open your, if you pop out your chat window, in the bottom right, uh, to the right where it says everyone, there should be those, those three dots for more. Um, and then you can save the chat. So if you want to take a moment, you can look for that. And you can save the chat to your computer. Make sure you know where it's being saved to. Sometimes it has a, it creates a Zoom downloads folder. Um, but you, you can save the chat um, for the end of this. And we'll also save it and we can send it out. Um, and, uh, okay, that's going to rejoin us. Thank you. Um, so you can save the chat, and sometimes you have really good questions and really good answers that will pop up in there. So that's another feature that we wanted to point out. Um, other, let me see, other other activities or uh, or kind of participant-centered um, engaging tools that uh, either any of my instructors here or any of our participants want to suggest. I wanted to add that if you, <laughs> thanks Fred. Fred for your note card, that was great. Um, if you can't see everyone right now, so you can't see the hands or the cards, going to gallery view is possible in the top right corner of Zoom in case you don't know. Um, I'm in gallery view now and one thing you can do to get informal feedback that's really quick from your students, especially while you're in the middle of a presentation, so you don't want to stop, but you want to give them a way to let you know how they're doing is by using Zoom's reactions. So I'm giving a thumbs up right now because I like my own suggestion very much. Um, if you scroll to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a little reactions button. It's a smiley face with a plus by it. Jack's got a thumbs up, Scott's got a heart. I am gonna switch to party mode over here, so I'm having a great time. If a student is not doing so well, you could use the happy, it's technically laughing tears, but it could be used to signal that you need to slow down or they're having trouble, you know, following along or something. You could also give the shock face for or like, I'm not really sure I understand what's going on. So these are things that students can do that are unobtrusive that let you reach a natural stopping point for whatever presentation you're giving um, without having to stop and say, please give me feedback now. So the reactions is a really useful feature sometimes. And uh, Virginia, while you're here, um, would you mind introducing yourself briefly? And again, I apologize yes. for missing that important note at the beginning. No worries. So I work with NAFSI, that's the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange. I am the communications person. Um, I will be taking notes during this whole presentation. So everything that we're talking about right now, Zoom polling, reactions, I will send you a, an agenda with annotations to all, uh, links to all of Google's help files, sorry, Zoom's help files on all of these features after this webinar is finished. So um, you do not have to take notes on everything that we're showing you or, um, figure out how to do all of these right now during the webinar. I'll be sending you notes afterward. Um, I do NAFSI's social media, our website. Um, I've been emailing you a lot about this workshop. So thanks for joining us today. Awesome. And you will be hearing more from Virginia on kind of the philosophies of virtual learning. Um, and I do encourage you to take notes there, um, especially. Uh, Jack asked, can you save poll summaries? Yes, and in fact, I didn't tell you, but I didn't make this an anonymous poll, so I can see who came prepared. Um, so you can actually, in, in your Zoom account, um, after the fact, you can, you can download a, um, an Excel file and then sort and look up who answered what. Um, so you don't have to tell your students that, but um, it can be handy um, to just kind of know who, you know, where people are coming from. So, and, and sometimes I'll set up polls for a webinar uh, and ask, you know, not just name agency organization, but 
ask, um, you know, like something relevant to the content, like how familiar are you with X, Y, Z that we're going to talk about? And so it's a way to see, you know, in an anonymous way, the students feel anonymous, but then I can sort of look after the fact and see how somebody felt um, going into uh, going into the into the class. So um, the next unit. Oh, sorry. Are there any other questions, comments before we move on? Okay. Um, and again, please feel free to keep using that chat window. So our next exercise that we're going to do is using the Zoom breakouts. So what we're going to do, um, if, if you have multiple hosts, as we do today, and just so you know, for Zoom, I made uh, my co-instructors co-hosts. So they have some of the capabilities that I do as the, you know, the Zoom account holder, um, so, uh, but they don't have all of the same powers. Um, but it's good to be clear with your co-instructors, even in a virtual environment, about what roles people are going to be playing. So, for example, when I put you into the Zoom breakout, uh, Zoom breakout rooms, um, then I'm going to try to get my instructors into each of the, in, have somebody in each of the rooms uh, with you. Um, so we'll uh, we'll see if we can do that. And while they're if while they're in there, if if I successfully get them into the right rooms, um, then they might be able to help facilitate um, the discussion that you'll have. But it'll be mostly up to your own creativity. Um, so when you send people to, uh, oh, there's some stuff again. Um, so when you send when you send people into a Zoom breakout. Um, in, uh, in Zoom in particular, and I know there are other platforms, but for Zoom, um, you, it, it's, the chat window will remain consistent um, when you go into the breakout. So I'm going to type your task here, and I would recommend doing this for your classes. Uh, so your task is come up with a team name. So I'm typing that into the chat window, so everybody should be able to see that even when you go into, uh, into the breakout. So you are going to be broken up into, I'm going, to, I'm going to put you in Zoom breakout rooms. You're going to have three minutes to come up with a team name. Um, I will send a, a reminder to everybody um, that there, it should be a little blue thing that flashes on the top that, uh, that lets you know when there's two minutes left. And then when there's one minute left, you'll get a warning that will start counting down. And if you come back on your own, um, then you know, you're done. But if you don't come back on your own at the end of that minute, then you will be brought back automatically. So it'll make more sense when we do it. But for now, uh, you're going to be sent into breakouts, and your task in your small group will be to come up with the team name. So I'm going to start setting up these breakouts. Let's see. I'm going to do four rooms, I think. Or Dave, would you prefer I do five? Four. Okay, Dave wants four rooms. Okay, we're going to go into four rooms. Um, let's see. Hopefully this will work. So see you in the breakouts, and you'll have three minutes, uh, T minus, and uh, come up with a team name. Welcome back. As you're coming back, I should note that it, it appears you're automatically muted when you come back. Uh, so if you were chit-chatting in, uh, in your breakout room right now, you should be automatically muted. Uh, that helps a little bit with uh, disturbance as you're coming back. Looks like some people are still coming up with their team name, but they'll be back soon. Mm, breakout room two, bunch of troublemakers. All right, folks, we'll be back momentarily. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Um, and just as a note, you should have come back automatically muted. So if you wanted to, if you want to talk, um, then you might need to unmute yourself. So um, let's hear what these team names are. So breakout room one, we had Beth, Dave, Rick, and Thomas. What did you guys come up with? I am making Thomas a spokesperson, and I think he put it in the uh, chat window what our team name was. Excellent. All right, fire lighters. I like it. Okay. Um, I see Fred actually told group group three is the international gang. Cool. All right. Thank you, group three. Uh, group two, you guys were in there talking for a while. For a while, what did you come up with? Scott, I'm going to put you as the spokesperson. Sure. Um, our two, uh, Stefan and uh, is it, was it Mike? Um, 
or no, Matt, Stefan and Matt are both from the Georgia area, and I used to work in Region 8 for the Forest Service, so we're coming up with Fish and Grits. Fish and Grits, that's awesome. All right, thank you. Um, and then Group 4, Jack Sites, is Fire Adapted. So I'm liking these team names. Awesome. All right. So thanks, everybody. And uh, so just a note, so um, so in, when you're in a breakout room, um, there, there are some, yeah, thanks for typing those into the chat window. Um, when you're in a breakout room, um, you've probably observed that you have a more, you have more interactive dynamics. Um, what are some other benefits of being you noticed? It was easier to talk to people um, because even if you talked a little bit over each other, you could um, self-correct that. It was just easier to have a small a conversation in a smaller setting. Great. Thank you, Zach. Also, peer pressure plays a role there where you're in a smaller group and, you know, if there's only four of you and three of you speak, you kind of feel like, oh, I guess I have to say something. So that's a good advantage. Yeah. Thank you, Al. All right, I will note just a little uh, etiquette thing. It is good to let people know the plan. Um, and sometimes you might lose people as you come back from the breakout group. So it's always good to set the expectation. Like if you need to take a break at the end of your breakout, if it's longer than three minutes, um, then make sure people come back and that you have an agenda so people know to keep moving when they transition from a breakout room back to the, to the main room. Um, all right, we need to keep rocking and rolling on. Um, I think Virginia has the next uh, section. Did I get that right, Virginia? Yes, I do. So I am, as the media person for NAFC, I've held a bunch of different roles before NAFC working with uh, digital education in a lot of different spaces with a lot of different folks who had a lot of different goals. So I feel like I know a lot about the technical tools to make this work for you. My goal right now is to touch on a lot of options because I want you to leave this meeting not knowing how to use every tool, but understanding what tools are available to you that you can then look up um, via blog posts or help uh, functions for whatever software you're going to be teaching in, um, basically to get you thinking about how you can do your course and make it work for you. So I want to talk a little bit about educational philosophy. So we called this workshop how to optimize fire education courses rather than how to adapt fire education courses for a virtual environment because we want you to think about how to make these courses the best they can be in a digital environment rather than taking what you had in person and converting it. The difference seems very subtle, but when you start from the beginning building a digital course, then I find that at least for myself, I think about the course differently and I end up with a slightly different result. So there are many digital tools available to help you on your journey to a great digital course, but all a great digital course needs is a great host. You could have an engaging, amazing um, digital teaching experience if all you have is a video connection to your students or even an audio connection and some way to chat with them by text, email or something else. So don't tell yourself that digital courses are somehow less good automatically than in-person courses. If you are there and you bring your energy with you, then your course will be great too. That said, there are many tools that can make it easier on you to bring that energy and to pull your students along with you, okay? Like I said, I'm taking notes, so you will get links to all of these functions that I'm gonna list off, along with help files and links, um, online links so that you can figure out how to use these for yourself later after this is done. So I wanna couple, uh, cover a couple things we've already done. The breakouts that we just did, as a host, you can control those very minutely. So if you have people register for a meeting before they come, at least in Zoom software, you can preset the breakout rooms so you can designate who's in which breakout rooms. You can also do that by hand while the meeting is in progress or you can have it be random. Once you send students to a breakout room, you can have a countdown timer in the top right corner that counts down all the way from four minutes to zero along with that one minute warning that pops up in the middle. 
if you'd like. Um, and there are additional, we talked about polling earlier, there are additional feedback mechanisms that you can use for students uh, so they can give you nonverbal feedback while you're in the presentation. So if you enable the right options and if your students and you all have a high enough version of Zoom, and again, many of these functions depend on your Zoom version, you can click buttons like go slower, go faster, raise hand if you want to ask a question, that sort of thing. With Zoom, you cannot modify your settings when you're in a meeting or a webinar. You have to do that in an internet browser on a computer, not on a mobile device, before the meeting starts. So check out which options you'd like to have before your meeting starts. We've also been using the chat window a lot. Zoom has the ability to break the chat window apart from a Q&A window. The chat window is just like you see it today. People can talk to each other. They can send private messages. Uh, they can talk to just the host. You can enable as the host. You can, uh, again, minutely control all of those options. So if you want only hosts to be able to send messages to everyone, you can make that happen. If you want nobody to be able to send private messages to one another, you can make that happen too. If you save the chat as a host, Post, you will not be saving nor can you view any private messages. So if that makes you uncomfortable that your students might be messaging each other privately, just turn that setting off before your meeting starts. Um, if you like the idea that your students could have discussion without you so that they can feel a little bit more anonymous and comfortable, leave it on. Um, and then uh, the Q&A feature is useful sometimes. <laughs> so the Q&A feature allows people to ask questions and then vote them up. So if you say, I'm going to have you think of questions for one minute, put them in the Q&A feature, then you allow one more minute after that for people to vote on the questions that they most want to hear the answers to. The ones with the most votes will rise to the top so that you can answer in priority order according to your students what they want to hear about from you. The problem with the Q&A feature is that if people put uh, questions in the chat, they will not transition over to the Q&A box and you will not see them there, nor will you be able to vote on them there. So every time that I've been in a meeting that uses the Q&A feature, uh, people, the post had, host had to say verbally and in the chat window multiple times, do not put your questions here. We will only be checking the Q&A window uh, to, to answer questions there. Let's see. Um, there are many options for screen sharing. So I'm going to show you one. This will be about the only technology I demonstrate for you right now. You can share your screen with a PowerPoint or whatever. I am sharing a whiteboard. And this can be really useful if you want to have students um, get to drawing together or using visual cues with each other um, when you, uh, especially when you're not there, if they don't have another way to meet and sketch things out together. This could be useful if you're doing a sand table exercise or if you're talking about maps or physical spaces in fire. Um, you could even set up a meeting that your students can attend without you uh, where they could just have that whiteboard function open. Um, screen sharing is another thing that you can control very minutely as the host. You can uh, determine permissions. You can have dual screen sharing, which your students will only be able to see if they have more than one monitor set up for themselves. Um, and then another thing we could do is hide students so that they can see each other better. So I see right now that Matt um, does not have video on, so I can actually hide that screen, which makes everyone else's videos get bigger. This is useful if you want to have people call in by phone, but then take them off the screen so people can see just the video participants, okay? Um, so let's see, other useful functions. Amanda demonstrated this earlier, but the spotlighting function changes for everyone who is big. This can be useful, for example, if you're doing a sand table exercise. This window from Ben Arnold is not making any noise, so Zoom doesn't want to focus on it. But if you want to talk and have Zoom focus on it anyway, then you can just um, tell Zoom to set it as a spotlight window, and then you can cancel that whenever you would like that to be done. Um, let's see, you can have virtual backgrounds. Requiring virtual backgrounds can take away some of the uh, stigma of showing people your home. Um, let's see. And finally, if you have people register for a Zoom meeting before they get to the meeting, you can tell Zoom to administer a post-meeting poll. So Zoom will automatically, when they close their Zoom window, pop up a poll for them that says, 
something about the meeting. You know, how was it? How do you feel? You could use those for post meeting quizzes when you're actually doing classes if you like, but you have to set those up again before the meeting starts. And for that one, you have to have people register through Zoom. That was a ton of tech information. <laughs> Again, I hope that it expands um, your view of what's possible if you didn't know about all those features. The main point that I want you to take away from all this is not you have to learn all of those. The main point I want you to take away is that if you want it to be possible, it probably already is. You just need to know how to make it happen for you. So I'm going to be sharing, like I said, the help files for all those features. I'm going to list them out for you when we send you stuff after this uh, workshop is over. But if there's something else that you wish you could do with your students, you probably can. You just need to figure out how to do it. If that means you'd like to contact me after this workshop is over, I'm going to drop my email address in the chat box. Um, I've been emailing you a ton already, so I hope you already know how to contact me. But I'm happy to help you figure out your tech because the whole point of this workshop is to make things great for you. So use tech as a tool. Do not use it as a crutch. Don't think of it as necessary for greatness. Design your course the way you want it to be and then figure out which features can help you get there, okay? That was a lot of stuff. I feel like I blasted through it, even though I told you I'd be giving you notes later. So I'm gonna count down from 10 and give us like a 10 minute squiggle break or like turn off your camera and do whatever break. Sorry? 10 seconds. 10 you seconds, 10 what did I say? <laughs> I said 10 minutes. I'm gonna give you 10 seconds. It's such a difference between 10 seconds and 10 minutes. Thank you, Amanda. All right, I'm gonna count down from 10. Everybody do whatever you want. I'm gonna turn my video off and stretch. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and we're back. All right, so that's been a lot of general features of Zoom. Does anyone have any questions, any discussion points they'd like to bring up now? We're happy to save things for the Q&A later, but if there's anything that you're like burning to talk about now, let us know. Yeah, Virginia, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, this may not be the right time, but um, if in our agency, specifically for me with the forestry, we're not allowed to use Zoom as a platform uh, for training, but we can, if another agency or uh, university is going to host it, we can, you know, be involved in it. So can another organization host it, but then hand over the ability to somebody like me to set up the meeting and do all this behind the scenes work, even though I'm not the host of it? The short answer is yes. Host controls are another thing that has a lot of fine tune variability within Zoom. So right now, Amanda is the host of this meeting and us other instructors are co-hosts. That means that we have almost all of the controls that she does, but we can't invite people to be hosts and do a, a couple other top level things like that. If you are a co-host or a host, you should have all the controls that you need. You can pass hosts, you can pass hosting privileges to someone else, and then they can even drop out of the meeting. So if they set it up for you, they can make you a host and then leave, and they don't even have to hang around for the meeting. Um, you can also have, if you have a tech helper, uh, there's a level below co-host, and I can't remember what that is, but they have um, increased, increased control as well, but not quite at co-host level. So there are a lot of different tiers of control that Zoom lets you have. But again, that short answer is definitely yes. Thank you. Any other questions, problems, solutions y'all would like to share? Okay. I see Scott in the chat window. We will definitely get to that in the q and I'll make a note of that for later. For now, I wanna move on to being fire line specific questions, problems, and solutions, okay? So far, this has been just very general Zoom. And I feel like you could find a lot of this information um, you know, all over the web, but we really, really wanna focus on how to make fire line teaching excellent. So I'm actually gonna hand it over to Ben. And Ben, if you could start by introducing yourself and then launch right in, um, we're ready for you. So hi everyone, my name is Ben Arnold. I'm a forest ranger for the state of Rhode Island. I've been uh, instructing NWCG classes now for um, a few years. And uh, when the st at the start of the pandemic, I was able to take a couple of Fireline classes virtually on like a Zoom or Microsoft Teams platform. 
Um, and one of the things that really struck me as very beneficial to doing classes virtually was um, the classes I took used sand tables. And I found that using these sand tables on a virtual platform was, uh, they, it didn't lose anything by doing it in person. In fact, uh, part of me found that it was actually a little bit better. I found it a lot easier focusing on a sand table during a tactical decision game um, when it's just on my computer screen and I can just focus on the table and not being in a room full of people when you're kind of on the hot seat doing those, um, those tactical decision games. So I, what I did was I set a uh, sand table up in the room I'm in and I want to show you kind of how I did that. I'm not going to go through any, any kind of uh, decision game on the table. I'm just going to kind of go through how I set it up. So on your view over here, there's, uh, if you're in gallery view, you can see there's um, a video up in the corner that says bird's eye, and that's focusing down on a sand table. And Virginia already showed it once, but I'm gonna go, because I'm a co-host, I'm gonna go over here and spotlight that. So everybody should see the top of my sand table. All right, does everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, good. So basically, the way this is showing this sand table is I just have, um, I'm signed in on my iPhone as well. And it's basically just positioned above that sand table. So you get that bird's eye view of the sand table. So I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight myself as well. And I'm gonna take my webcam and just kinda, kinda show everybody how I did that. Okay, so basically I just have a tripod set up on, uh, with my phone attached to it and it's looking down, sorry the light's kind of bright, on a sand table. So, to show you another view and another way that I can show you the sand table is I can switch it over to this view as well. And this is basically just another angle of that sand table. And I'm going to switch my camera back and show you how I did that. So there's me again. I'm going to pick up this. I have another camcorder set up looking down at that sand table from a different view. All right. So another benefit of having that camcorder is that uh, that camera, that big camera, has another mic on it. And I can also switch to the microphone on that large camera. So I'm gonna do that right now. And it probably sounds to everybody like I'm a little bit further away, right? So I'm gonna switch the camera back over to that as well. You see the other view. And it's gonna sound like I'm getting closer to that camera. It should, because I am getting closer. And now I can manipulate that camera to kind of focus in on different areas of our sand table. If I want to focus on what this squad of plastic army men is doing, or what they're looking at, and everything else I have, or maybe kind of view different uh, topography features that are going to change what your tactical decision games does, I can. And I can go back to my wide view as well. come back over to my camera, switch back to my regular mic. And these are just a couple of different views for sand tables. All right, so I'm going to switch back to myself. There I am. All right, so that um, larger camcorder, um, I'm going to show it to you one more time. Basically, that camera has an HDMI cable that comes off the back of the camera. And I've got that hooked right into my desktop computer. But the problem with using an HDMI connection is it's typically you use an HDMI cable to go from a computer to something else, whether that be a television screen or a projector that can send video out. It doesn't usually send video from a camera into a computer. So one of the things I had to buy, I'm gonna show this to you now, was a video capture card. 
I don't know if everybody can see that. Um, and I'm going to um, possibly put a link in the chat room, or I'm going to at least put my contact information in there if anybody has any questions about that. So basically, when I hook that camera up through that capture card, through the HDMI cable, Zoom recognizes that larger camera as an additional webcam. That's how you convert an additional camera into a webcam. So when I go down to my, my camera icon down at the bottom here, it shows me as having, oops, sorry, I shut myself off. It shows me as having two web cameras and it tells you one is the USB port and one is your um, actual web camera on the computer. And that's how I can switch in between those. So it is also possible that you can um, turn an, uh, a phone, a smartphone into a web camera, but it involves uh, downloading additional software or possibly applications. And I had some issues with this because I work for state government and my computer is firewalled. So it, I would need webmaster permission to do this and I knew I wasn't gonna get it, so I didn't try to do that. So one of the things I found when trying to set this stuff up is you need to like get a little creative. I'm pretty fortunate in that I have access to some pretty cool audio and video equipment, but not everybody does. Um, if you can get creative, if you can use a phone, if you can, if you have one of those detached web cameras that like clips onto the top of your computer, like I do, if you can get an extended cord for that, you can set up some kind of a sand table or any visual aid that you need to, um, to get by with that and, and make this usable. Does anybody have any questions right now on sand tables or Fireline visual aids? Ben, this is a great um, idea and a great process. So are, do you have like a FAQ that could be maybe set up with just a little bit of this schematic? I tried to take some notes here, but I could see this as being something that could be shared at a greater level with other uh, presenters that are in the process of starting to develop these um, virtual deliveries of NWCG courses. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I'm going to put my contact information in the uh, chat room, and I'm also going to stick around for about a half an hour after we're done with this training today. So if people have specific questions, you can either um, ask me then or you can contact me, um, you know, at any other time. I will also, I am taking notes and I will be describing Ben's setup in writing uh, along with his information in the notes that you'll get once this training concludes. Great, thank you. Ben, you mentioned that you took an NWCG course early in the pandemic that um, had some of these tricks. Would you mind um, sharing which class that was? I just um, am wondering, where, inevitably I'm gonna have to connect with some other cadre members and try to incorporate some of these tricks into my, uh, my repertoire. Yeah, um, the two classes that I took during the pandemic um, were S200, and I think that was Initial Attack, Incident Commander, and I took uh, the Wildland Urban Interface training as well. I can't remember if they both used sand tables. I think it was just the uh, Initial Attack IC class that did, but it, it, it really struck me as a usable tool for the virtual platform. I was really impressed with how it was done. Well, you've done a great job demonstrating it to us because I'm impressed. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to add, and apologies, Ben, if you said this and I missed it, but right now for me, I've got two screens spotlighted. Ben is on the right, and then the bird's eye camera view is on the left with his cell phone. Ben literally just signed in twice to this Zoom meeting. So that bird's eye camera on the left side is him just hitting the Zoom sign in button on his camera instead of on his phone. So if you need to show multiple views and you don't have multiple cameras, that's another option if you have multiple devices, uh, just to mute one of them and just give you an extra view that you can share with your students. All right, um, I know we're coming up on a decent break soon, but um, before we leave, uh, optimizing 
uh, before we leave this section on optimizing uh, more uh, fireline specific stuff, um, Virginia, I think, had some other suggestions that um, Dave and Ben and I had come up with, um, and, and Virginia, of course, um, of other, other tips and tools for, uh, for optimizing fireline courses. Um, Virginia, yes. do you want to go through that before break? Yeah, so um, I canceled the spotlight videos, which means you can switch back to gallery view if you'd like. Um, so I wanted to give you another rundown of how COVID and switching to digital can be viewed as an opportunity to do some things uh, in digital courses that you can't do when you're in face-to-face. -face. Again, I want to stick with this theme that digital courses are great in their own right. You just got to know what you're doing a little bit. Um, so one thing you can do with a digital course that you can't do in person as easily is bring in a guest instructor. We've been talking a lot about collaborating across, I mean, we're all in different places right now. So collaborating with other instructors um, and sharing their expertise with your students is an opportunity you can take advantage of. Um, from the tech side, just making sure everybody's on the exact same page. Do they know which breakout room they're going to go into? Do they know what their role is before you send them to breakout rooms? So making sure you've discussed the technical aspects with your guest instructors is important. We actually, the instructors on this call, went through a dry run of this whole training yesterday with each other, which was really helpful uh, just to work out some of the kinks and make sure we were all on the same page and to get feedback from each other. You can also easily share video clips, but bandwidth can be a problem. The solution I like best is to share my screen, start playing the video on YouTube or wherever it is. But before I do that, I give people the amount of time that the video takes to watch, plus an extra one minute on either side. So if it's a three minute video, I'll say you have five minutes to watch this video. I'll drop the link to the video in the chat box. And then if they're on a low bandwidth connection, they can actually leave and watch that video on their own and then come back to the meeting. So that way they can uh, have their internet adjust the resolution of that video so that it doesn't you know, crash their connection or anything like that. Um, live exhibits or demos like Ben demonstrated are still totally possible in a digital world. If you want to do it, you can use uh, me and others as resources. Um, and when it comes to assessment, gear your assessment to be digital first. So it would be, I think, fairly easy to think about giving a quiz in a digital world that you used to give on a piece of paper, right? But there are other ways to assess uh, skills and other practical aspects digitally. So if you are teaching a chainsaw course, you could have your students make a video of themselves demonstrating chainsaw safety techniques, or you could have them make a picture and then write on it or annotate it or something like that. You can still have them demonstrate uh, understanding and application of skills, even though you are not there in person. You can even just call them, have a private one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting uh, or other meeting in a different software to get these sorts of things. Um, and I wanna make sure your assessment matches your desired outcome. So whatever they need to demonstrate in order to pass the course, figure out what that demonstration needs to be first and then figure out how you're gonna have them demonstrate to, that to you. So this is the backwards design concept, concept. What is the goal of the course? What is the outcome you want? And then figure out how, can, how you can use digital tools to get yourself there. Um, one thing that we're doing today is we like to have all these rules um, and I think Dave Crary is the king of this. You tell people to be on video, but then if you design your course in such a way where they have to be, then they will be. So we are talking to you a lot today. We're asking you to give us feedback. We're sending you to breakout rooms. We're asking you to be in the chat box. So we're hoping that by making this very interactive, you, even if there are distractions behind you, we keep pulling you back into this call. Um, the same goes for cheating with assessments and things like that. If you have them do a video call with you to demonstrate chainsaw safety techniques, rather than choose a multiple choice something or other. If you're worried about cheating, it's a lot harder to cheat when they're on a video call than it is when they're doing a poll uh, asynchronously. And then the other thing that's possible with tech and digital courses that may not be possible otherwise is accessibility and accommodations. So you can have colorblind checkers, you can have captioning, live captioning, you can, um, uh, I don't even know, with mics, uh, people be able, might be able to, um, give you feedback uh, more easily than they can. Otherwise, they can uh, use the chat box instead of just having to speak verbally. So there are um, lots of resources I'll share with you after this webinar is done for accessibility issues. 
So that's all of my Fireline specific tech that I wanted to run through. It's 10.04. Um, I know that y'all might have questions or solutions that you would like to share from your courses, but I do want to give us a break. So if you need to, drop a note in the chat box so you don't forget your question and then we'll take note of them and answer them during the Q&A period at the end. Or if you have a solution you'd really like to share right now, drop that in the chat box as well so nobody forgets. Um, we are going to give you a 10 minute break, 11 minutes by my clock. We will meet back here exactly exactly at 1015 to start again on the next exercise, which is your homework and your designing of a um, lesson that you're going to teach us before the workshop ends. Amanda, anything else you want to say before we cut out? Just a suggestion as you send your students to break, remind them that that might be a good time to mute their line and turn off their camera because you never know what you're going to see in the background. Um, so I will pause recording. Um, while we take a break, um, but just remind people to, you know, again, turn off your camera and mute your line, and we will see you back here at 10.15, ready to go. 10.15 Eastern. 10.15 Eastern. Eastern. Don't be an hour late. Thank you. <laughs> here. So, all right. Um, hopefully, yep, Dave will be rejoining us shortly because he is essential to this next exercise. So, um, hopefully you had, oh, hey Dave, is that a question or comment or just letting me know you're back? Letting me know you're back, thank you. Okay, copy. All right, so um, this adaptation we're gonna work on is homework. Um, so you might want to give your students an assignment and we're gonna do that by actually practicing and have, having you do an assignment. What we're going to do is we're going to break into the same teams that we were on before, and you are going to prepare your own lesson for a virtual environment, which will yield an action plan. You're going to be assigned a topic, which will be the same for everybody, and what we're going to do is compare different methods of how you might teach that. So one group, well, they will explain. Um, when you break into groups, um, we want to, uh, we, we suggest you kind of come up with a script, assign roles, you'll figure out how to do it, just like you would if you were in an NWTG class and being given a team exercise that you have to work through. Um, again, we're trying to just introduce uh, different media, different ways of teaching something, rather than just the death by PowerPoint, which everybody's all too familiar with. Um, and we want to give you a chance to, to have your students be exposed to some different ways of teaching and learning as well that are more interactive. So you'll be more interactive in doing those. Um, we do understand that you might not have the capability to do everything that you want to for this exercise right now, and that's okay. Again, this is a class, um, so you can, uh, you can adapt and learn it. If you had all the time in the world, you could have the, the perfect class. But um, I think I'll have Dave explain the exercise, and then I will, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with the reminder about, uh, about the time that we'll have. Um, you'll have about 25 minutes in breakout to complete the exercise. So, Dave, you ready to explain what everybody is going to do? All right, Dave is almost ready. And uh, I should also give Dave a chance to read Crary. Thank you, Crary here. Um, so, I'm Dave, so give... Crary. I'm Dave Crary, the fire management officer at Cape Cod National Seashore. I'm the card guy. Uh, I like people to have their last name, and even though it shows there, this is much more eye-catching. And if someone wanted to speak, like let's say Matt Schneider wanted to speak, if he just held up Schneider, we would say you'd be able to see it because I'm looking at all 16 people. Okay, but we have a homework assignment here. And this homework assignment, I'm going to try to play this. I don't use Zoom that much either because of the um because we can't i have to use teams for the federal government so hopefully i'm sharing my screen i would like some confirmation is the train the trainer up there okay i see that sometimes uh stop share sometimes there's a yes card which helps you get to see a bunch of those of course now i go gotta go back and share this screen it takes just a little bit now Amanda's on there. I don't know how, there we go. Now, whoops, now I'm confused because this doesn't toggle through. Here we go. We, if you can see this, does this say Hogwarts, et cetera? I need some confirmation. I see that. Okay, we in our breakout groups are going to have 25 minutes to prepare a lesson, which we will share with the rest of the participants and it's how to, 
perform or how to make a face cut. This is for tree felling. This isn't that Silence of the Lambs movie. So face cut. I'm going to give group one, which is my group, the first choice. Would you like to be Gryffindor, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, or Ravenclaw? Or would you like to be Hogwarts, which is a wild card? Basically, group one and Tom, you're going to be the spokesperson. We in our breakout group have to come up with a presentation that we're going to give to the rest of the group. And it's going to be a video using... Uh, something from outside and we're gonna, someone's gonna have to run outside with a cell phone or make a PowerPoint or do a video inside without actually pointing to a real tree. We're using a student workbook. I'll explain a little bit more, but Tom, what do you want? Let's go with Hogwarts. Go for the okay. wild card. Okay, you're gonna go for a wild card. Group two, who's the spokesperson, please? Scott, I lie, was this is Scott. So I will take Ravenclaw. Okay, so you're we'll going to use the student workbook and you can find that on the NWCG website, which if I do this right, I'm still sharing my screen, I believe, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. So there's the website for all this stuff. I mean, even for video, you can take a video of the student workbook, I guess. Okay. I'm moving back and then I'll stop sharing shortly. It's group three. Meaning I, need... I don't I'm know sorry. if it's me since I put the other thing, but uh, I'm not sure about the capacity of Virginia Allen Fanny for video capability. I don't have it. So if I was making the decision myself, I'd have to go with the only one that doesn't have video involved, and that's Slytherin. Okay, so you're going to do a PowerPoint one. This leads us up to group four. Choices. Is, uh, is Hufflepuff or Gryffindor available? I'm sorry, I wasn't following. Yes, video, okay. in or, video in or out, or just something video that you're going to try yeah. to show, and mm -hmm. that might be challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, so we have you those, video. okay, and with your group, and you can do the breakout. So pretty soon, a man is going to take over and do the breakout things, but if you know what group you're in, you have your assignment. The goal is not necessarily to make the most polished, best presentation. And I know it's on the fly, but we just, we are going to benefit from each group's efforts uh, to uh, put this together. And as the instructor, I'm gonna suggest the first five minutes of your breakout session will be to develop a script now, you don't have to show that, but don't just start taking videos. Come up with a script of what you would do in this situation. Basically, the face cut is that first cut and falling a tree. Hopefully, everyone's at least somewhat aware of that. But we're going to make a presentation online, virtually, to show to other students. The other students are being the other three groups, and we'll have a different varieties. But your script would be get together, talk, jot down notes. If I was going to be really mean, I'm still sharing my screen, which I always forget. If I was being really mean, I'd say you have to show us your script. But I'm not being mean. This is all for learning. I don't think people have A or B cards because we didn't set that up. But uh, um, thumbs up means we're all set to go. And uh, Palm means we need questions. So I need to see everybody concurrently if we're all set to go. If I see any flat palm, I'm going to call. I see a yes. So yes, 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 yes. Steven's not. Uh, Georgia there, are you, you with us? Yes, sir. Okay, so th that's the thumbs up. That's the visual. And uh, see what happened is people didn't hold them. I was focusing on that and Rick put his hand down but I saw it up anyway that's where the cards really work when people hold them up you see them all across as an instructor and in my student con of conduct you have to have these okay Amanda take it away all right thank you Dave so I'm going to put you back into hopefully the same breakout room um, and you will have until 10:50 eastern time um, we'll bring I'll bring you back at 10:50, and I'll put a couple of little warnings uh, in there to just give you a little quick time check um, 
So do your best, and uh, we will. When you come back, if you need to take a little quick break before you get or before we come back, um, then please budget that in. Um, so I will see you at 10:50, and I will probably hop from room to room, um, virtually, obviously, um, just to uh, kind of check on you and see how you're doing. But you all have a very capable facilitator with you. See you soon. Okay. You might be. All right. Well, welcome back. I know that that was not enough time to plan a complete lesson, but uh, as with many things in the virtual environment, um, there's never quite enough time to make the lesson perfect. Um, so I think at this point, we're going to dive into the presentations, understanding, as you all know very well, that uh, everything is a work in progress. And we're going to, uh, we'd like to see each group's presentation and then just talk about what were some of the challenges and some of the, the lessons learned in trying to adapt this material to a virtual environment. Uh, Dave, do you want to do facilitation of this section? Yes, yeah. go for it, Dave. I'll mute. Oh. <clears throat> okay, uh, some people might be fixing stuff up. I can make an arbitrary and capricious decision, but do I have a volunteer, a group to go first? Zach, you got it. Okay. All right, is everybody ready? We're going to show, um, we're going to drop a a link to a YouTube video in the uh, chat window. It's uh, 33 seconds long. So in a minute and 30 seconds, we'd like to have everybody come back. First, we're gonna watch the video, then we're gonna come back. And there'll be a live demonstration. Jack, you, you dropping that it, into the... It okay. should be in there. Okay. And in the interest of time, since you had to keep this to three minutes, Lindsay, if you want to put up kind of our script. So even if you can't watch the 33 minute video clip, since we opted that, at least we can go through the script. Yep. And get, hey, get folks, right. Let me know if you see the chat feature. There should be a labeled fire adapted team script for face cut. Is everyone seeing that? I see yep. it in the chat. So we have, we have three steps we said just in this quick a lot of time, you know, a quick intro, share a link to a video clip that people can watch. Um, and then we're going to move on to Lindsay. She's going to share static screen just to talk through different face cuts. We have Zach who's actually going to do a live video demonstration, which we can record using his chainsaw outside on his garbage can. So my part's done with the video or providing the video clip. So um, Lindsay, go ahead with your screen sharing if you can. Does she have that option, Amanda? You should. Yeah, here we go. All right. Oh, you're on mute, Lindsay. Thanks. So you guys should all see the, the three types of undercuts or face cuts that are, are done across the world. Um, depending on where, where you live, you might have learned one or the other or depending on where you've been retrained, um, or perhaps even the industry, whether it's wildland fire or timber industry, there are various ways and preferences. But for the sake of this lesson today, Zach will be going over a conventional cut. Okay. Uh, take it away, Zach. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Yep, yeah, as Lindsay mentioned, I'm gonna demonstrate a conventional cut. I'm gonna do my bottom cut first, contrary to this, diagram and then I'll do the top cut and then uh, I'll demonstrate the back cut even though we're only really demonstrating the face cut. And I'm going to unplug from my microphone and then I'll talk a little bit louder so everybody can hear what I'm doing. And I'll be demonstrating on this blue garbage can behind me. Okay, Amanda, can you pin Zach so his screen's larger, please? I tried to do that. Um, everybody might want to uh, pin Zach's video on their own as well. Okay. And just to clarify, you did want to leave up the PowerPoint slide? Yeah, we can, leave we can also spotlight you, Zach, and that will take over the PowerPoint presentation and exit it out. Would you prefer that? Sure. Okay. Ah, it does not. Oh, well, we just discovered something. Yeah, so well, I can't override the okay. screen sharing. So, Lindsay, if you stop I'll screen stop sharing. sharing. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. There we go. Okay. I wonder if Zach's using his headphones, and that's why we can't hear. Yeah, he doesn't have headphones. We... Oh. 
I guess he does. You can go back to the headphones. Okay. Here's my tree. I'm going to make my bottom cut. I'm going to go about two thirds of the way into the tree, no more than half. I'm going to use the sights here on the chainsaw to line up where I want the tree to fall. Then I'm going to complete the cut by going at a 45 degree angle to the tree and cutting in until it matches that bottom cut. All right, end of demonstration. I just un I just canceled the spotlight video, so everybody should be able to switch back to gallery view. And if you share, that'll be big. All right. So from our fire adapted group, uh, how how did it feel? Um, what challenges or specific adaptations did you try to uh, did you yeah did you try to uh, did you try out? Uh, by each of us sharing different screens or presenting that that fluid motion, uh, getting that down or doing dry runs will, will be beneficial to work those kinks out. And we had the script set up three parts. You know, if this was an actual class, we would have died. I mean, we could have pulled up a couple different YouTube videos and, you know, pause them, walk students through the different cuts. Um, Plus then showing the static, plus then Zach showing the live, um, kind of demonstrating through different options. I would say that preparation would really pay off here. And um, obviously, you know, it's a short, probably part of the lesson was to demonstrate that the more preparation you put into this, the better it's going to be. But yeah, I think even with a, an hour, we could have really honed that in to be something that we'd be proud of. And if we were making a video beforehand, I mean, we, we would know that you know, what equipment we would need or work with Virginia to get an actual video, our own video clip set. Rary here, I saw, I did link on the YouTube video and I did learn that the noise from the video was going in my speaker here and I had to mute. Uh, but I saw you had a YouTube video, you had a demonstration, you did have a slide, although the pixelation on my screen didn't look that good. Uh, on one of them, the Humboldt, the open and the regular or whatever that that wasn't pixelated well, but The idea is to practice not to To, to do this. So we saw that now. Let's go to the next group a next group. So Prepare, you'll take it Okay, take it away All right, Alan thing. Let's see how this is gonna work. All right. I'm gonna share my screen Whoop. Why don't I Can y'all, can y'all see that okay? Can y'all see that okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, I would like first, uh, you know, what we're going to set it up kind of we have, uh, we're going to make a presentation on how to make the face cut and we broke it up into uh, kind of a beginning, a middle and an end. So I will take the, uh, and um, you know, we have our cadre there on the left. Hopefully you can see uh, our smiling faces and that's who we are and we would do introductions. Um, and then also we would do um, asking the students if uh, you've ever used a chainsaw to cut down a tree and know what a face cut is. So I'll ask that. Uh, can you show by a thumbs up or down uh, if you have ever performed a face cut? So it looks like we got a pretty experienced group. Um, we are going to make the assumption also that this is uh, just a continuing part of the training. So we're going to make the assumption everybody knows all about chainsaws and safety and such. Um, so our objectives at the end of this session will know the students will know what a face cut is and how to safely perform this step in the felling process. And then we'll turn it over to Al, which would do the content. So uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is give you a brief overview of what an actual face cut is. So within this PowerPoint, we're going to show you a short video of somebody actually performing a face cut. So Fred, if you would then 
select yeah, that. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get it up. I think we got a little delay in getting this uh, to show. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt just for a minute. Um, so we can't see the YouTube video because when you share your screen, you have to select which part of your screen you're sharing. So I imagine that when you shared your screen, you selected to share the PowerPoint. So I think what you'll have to do is go back to the share screen button and then select that YouTube video instead, whichever window you've got that video in op uh, open in. I ended that there because Virginia, you were saying something and I think it was the noise of the video was, was overtaking the, oh, um, so, so I'll just repeat it. So when you share your screen, you tell Zoom which part of your screen to share. Right now you're just sharing the PowerPoint, so we can't actually see the YouTube video, or at least I cannot. Oh. So if you go back down to the screen share button, the share screen button, and select whichever window has the YouTube video in it, your uh, internet browser most likely, then we'll be able to watch along with you. But unless you've got it in the PowerPoint embedded, which is something you can do if you want to, I can show you how to do that later. Um, unless you've got it embedded in the PowerPoint, you'll have to share which part of your screen, uh, a different part of your screen than you are now. Okay, so we'll just, uh, Al, we'll just, uh, for, for time's sake, we'll just kind of let you kind of tell exactly how you were going to handle this content section. Okay, okay, so again, given time, I would have embedded this actually into the PowerPoint, so when we played the PowerPoint, you would have been able to see it. And then I would have asked, are there any general questions about what we saw. And so that would, again, since we're using PowerPoint as our tool, would enable us to get some feedback um, from the students, and then we would move into sort of our review of that subject matter. And that would be Fanny. Okay. And then we would uh, turn it over to Fanny now. We would wrap this up with a kind of a, a review and uh, evaluation. Yeah, so just the last part of the PowerPoint presentation will be um, reminding, like, reporting the objectives of the class of that PowerPoint and just checking that every student's, um, you know, through questions or um, asking them, like, what they learned, if they understood everything, just make sure, like, an evaluation and that everyone got um, the knowledge from the class. So that was like what a face cut is, um, what are the steps to perform um, the face cut and all the safety issues to be able to fill the tree properly. Um, and I think ending the, this presentation um, with open questions for students to the instructors, that would be it. Okay, that's it. Okay. okay. Um, good job. I saw PowerPoint. I heard music and we had explanation. Next group. Uh, can I chime in just for a minute? I think one of the challenges with using PowerPoint is that when you're, if you don't have two monitors and you're trying to show the PowerPoint and then talk about the PowerPoint, that becomes really a challenge where you know, where again, that rehearsal is going to be key for you to be able to fluently move through your PowerPoint and still talk about all the things and still keep people interacting. I totally agree. And I taught a lot of classes in June and I set up my laptop so I could see I had it on mutt, I mean, mute. And uh, so I could see what I was presenting. And that also clued me in to take it off share, because you don't want to share all the time because then people can't see other people as well. Anyway, good, good observation, Al. Any other observations for the second presentation? Seeing none, we'll go to the third group, which is totally arbitrary until I pick somebody. The fire lighters can go if Beth, uh, can you share your screen? Um, I, the, the video that you sent me is still downloading. Oh, is it? All right. We'll, we'll need a second then if that's okay. 
or 35 minutes according to my computer oh jeez. <laughs> i i can I, I can try to see if i can do a, a share content on my ipad i've never done this before Can anyone see like this? That looks great. Looks like we're looking at your iPad. To start off, we have our Are you looking at a chainsaw? Edges, our yep. Yes. Plugs, and bring it. Our gloves and our chainsaw. So what we're going to do is we're going to assess the area to cut. So we're looking for hazards around here. So obviously we've got some um, some hazards in the area. But everything looks pretty good for the fell. So we're going to identify the tree. All right, looking at the tree, we don't have any any aerial hazards. Everything looks safe. All right, so what we'll do is we'll get geared up. All right, coming to the tree. We're going to look at it. All right, now we're going to start our base cut. All right, everything looks good. Still got plenty of holding wood. Now we're gonna do our open face cut. All right, we're looking up, looking around. Escape route looks good. All right, we're gonna do a back cut. And we're gonna have to let everybody know that we're doing a back cut. Back cut! <laughs> Fall in! Sight's clear. That was great. Great use yeah. of what you had on hand. Yeah, it was uh it was pretty difficult to put a video together pretty quick. Um but we uh, we came up with a plan that we wanted to identify the, the PPE need it for the operation and then we want to demonstrate how to do it i tried to get my four-year-old to do it but he wasn't agreeing to it so i had to wing it okay fire lotters any other comments from the team itself beth or rick good job thomas thanks for doing that Okay, yeah, so now I'm learning about technology today. So now uh, the group itself, I mean, uh, questions or statements, observations. I would like to hear someone make a comment, observation, or statement about the last group. I think it's better to cut real trees than garbage cans, and definitely <laughs> not in flip flops. Like I was doing. There I have we go. A comment, actually, um, so I could hear you laughing while you were sharing the video, which I really enjoyed. Um, but I think if you're sharing your screen on a portable device, it might be worth muting before you start sharing, so that way you can react to yourself. <laughs> and and um, unless you want to share that with your students, it made you very relatable because I was having fun too. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm I'm learning about the iPad and what I can do on it. Usually, I do this on my um my work computer, but we we can't use Zoom on it. Yeah, and again, just to reiterate, I think somebody already said this, but when you're you know preparing an actual training for a virtual environment, you're gonna have a little more time to prepare. You're gonna have time to get used to this stuff. Um, that was very well done on the fly. Anyone else? Hey, just a, go ahead. As a general question, um, since since different agencies have limitations on what technology they can use, um, I, I guess it's best to do a poll beforehand before you put your present before you choose your your your. Um, the, the technology you're using so that everybody can can um, do 
use every, you, you know, that, that they can get the most out of the training because they can use the tools. I, I don't know how that works. Maybe that's going to come up later. From a tech standpoint, uh, people do not have to, if you have a firewall on or some restriction on hosting within a software, other people can join you even if you, even if they have that same restriction. So joining a meeting is not the same as hosting a meeting. If you are concerned about it though, you could get in contact with a couple people that have key restrictions that you wanna test, invite them to a test meeting and just make sure they can join. But a lot of the joining capabilities don't depend on any login capabilities at all. You can join no matter what your personal hosting situation is. Yeah, this is how I checked with our IT department because we too, as a state agency, have the, the thing about Zoom. And what our IT director said was that their major concern is entities that are using the free version of Zoom as opposed to the an organizational version. Um, he had no problem with me joining in the meeting, knowing that it was coming from an organizational thing but he said it's the free version is is where from the IT department where they have major issues great conversation any other comments before we go to the last and final group and then we have another discussion round I forget who's who now Can we hear from fish and grit We're ready. You're up. Go ahead. Let me get to share my screen. Okay, today we have the student workbook uh, section of a face cut. Uh, one of the big things is staying involved with the student. So we would start with our script right here, which we'll be going through. Uh, you know, the undercut consists of two cuts, a gunning cut and a horizontal, or a gunning cut or horizontal cut, and then the matching cut. Uh, you should always be standing all the way up and holding the saw comfortably. Uh, face the tree in the general dura direction of the tree's predominant lean. Uh, can anyone tell me why we would wanna do that? Anyone? Mr. David? Gravity works. That's right. Gravity works. Don't try to fight it. Okay. Um, you know, if there's thick bark, you want to make sure and get all of that out of the way before you start your cut. Uh, the sp specific direction of the undercut, uh, you'll want to use the gunning sights. Um, this will just give you a direction of which way that you want the tree to fall. Um, you want to make sure that free of hazards, any snags, um, widow makers up top, make sure that the top's not gonna fall out on you. Uh, now, just for further demonstration, we will go to Mr. Matt. I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Matt and he can demonstrate it better with the image. All right. Matt, you're on mute. I'm back, sorry about that. Um, so our intent w with this was to use the, the image as a visual aid probably during the lecture. And I think um, in, in hindsight, it would probably, it, it works better if you want, if you display the image concurrently with the lecture. And if I had to pick one of those uh, five, four options, uh, I don't think I would use the student workbook again. Uh, the advantage of the student workbook is you essentially have a written script, but uh, it doesn't give you anything to interact with. You have to go find more. Copy, comments on Group fours. Yep, State. I got one. Go ahead, Lindsay. Hey, yep, Stephen, I thought you did a nice job at preparing your next presenter. Uh, you know, you, you, you'd verbally mentioned, okay, I'm gonna you know, toggle off and hand it over to Matt. And you gave him you know, a few seconds 
to, to get ready to, to take that over. So that was a good, good practice. Good observation. Virginia's up. So I've been taking notes so that I can share what's happening in this doc after the whole presentation is done. And I just wanted to share some of the things that I've learned from each group. Um, I think the first one where y'all demonstrated the cut on the trash can, there were two things I took away um, from that one that we didn't talk about. Um, one was that you don't have to uh, have the real equipment there to still visually demonstrate something. So the trash can, I got exactly what you meant because you were right next to it. You had the angles going. And so that was a great way to not be right next to a tree where there might not be internet, but to still demonstrate what you wanted to outside live. Um, the other thing I liked from that is that y'all pulled, you were the outside video group and you pulled an outside video group on a tree from YouTube. And I just want to point out that none of y'all have to start from scratch with your courses. There are probably already a lot of materials that you can pull in, especially this very first time you're teaching virtually. Go easy on yourself, take the pressure off, and just make sure you try out some new things that push you outside your comfort zone. And then if you get to be a pro and you have your entire video library set up by the spring or next summer, that's awesome. And you can pull from that anytime, but you don't have to make every single material yourself. There's probably a lot on the internet already available. Um, the second group that had the PowerPoint, um, I liked, and we didn't talk about this, I liked how they had their objectives in there because it's going to make it easier for them to assess their students at the end. And I wanted to point out that we've been very flexible trying out these different methods for teaching these concepts. But again, I, 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 want, I want us to think of assessments as a flexible option as well. So if you know what a face cut is, you could ask them, do you know what a face cut is? And they could describe it. Or you could say, now I want you to go make a PowerPoint presentation of your own with pictures. Show me what a face cut is or something like that. So the objectives were great. And I think it'll help with the assessment in the end. Um, the outside video, I loved your narration while you were working because that had the explanation at the exact same time that you were doing the actions. And so I thought pairing those two together um, was a great use of making your own video. I also thought that it was a really good display of instead of sitting inside being on a computer, you were connecting with um, I don't know, a more casual device, I suppose. Teachers don't usually think of using an iPad as their primary device, but it allowed you to screen share the video you just made without having to send it off to anybody. We didn't have to worry about that long download time. We didn't have to worry about sending uh, anybody away to YouTube. You could just share from the device you made the video on, which was really useful. Um, and then that last group, something we didn't talk about is if you wanted to pull up the workbook and talk through the workbook or some other text centered thing, um, even with the, the picture you had, there are different programs you can use to share those kinds of pictures and then write on them or highlight them live while you're talking about them. So you could highlight key phrases from the workbook and then explain things. You could pull up that picture from the tree. You could draw on it with arrows and key points of focus and then erase them and move on. Um, so technology can help you there if you want to make something that's static, live and more interactive. Great job, everybody. Hey, uh, Ben has a comment. So I just wanted to add on um, about the, um, the group that used the workbook. Um, I think Matt had mentioned that he you know, wasn't really a big fan of it, but one thing that you can do if you're teaching a class, an NWCG class or any class that requires you to go through a workbook anyways, um, I know the steps in making the undercut in that were by paragraph. You can actually choose people to read those paragraphs. And it's a way to make sure that your students are engaged in actually paying attention. If somebody's sleeping or checking emails and you call on them to read a paragraph, you're going to know if they were paying attention or not. So it's just another tip to uh, put in the toolbox. Great observation, Ben. Somebody else? Yeah, I think one with what we had with the student workbook, uh, having that much volume of information, uh, it'll be easy, kind of like a PowerPoint for them to just fall into a, a haze or a daze with the information. So uh, getting them more involved, having them read those, asking them questions, uh, having the visuals like Matt was saying, uh, as you're going, just something visual changing on screen to keep them 
it'd be tough to do a workbook type setting delivering that much information. It'd be worse than PowerPoint, in my opinion. But you made it better because you actually asked students questions that they could see on the screen, but you, you had them answer it, and I thought that was really good. Great conversations, everybody. You want to keep it going? I have some comments because I always do. I wanted someone to use the whiteboard. That was kind of that at large thing. You could, so I made my own. But see, here's my whiteboard. But A, B, and C. Unfortunately, I have to cut out A and B so I get to the side of the tree. <laughs> now I cough. Horizontal cut no more than one third of the way through. Um, angle cut. Base cut. Make sure you don't hit D. You need that holding wood in there. Snip. Oh, my finger, my finger, my scissors are broken at the tip. And anyway. There we go. I just did my face cut. Then I can do C and D. So there are lots of different ways and we can practice all those or you could assign somebody to do that. Okay, now is it, Amanda, where are we? Do I have a chance to talk for a minute or two? Absolutely. Okay, so here you are, you're an instructor. You're coming up with all these, we practice, we've seen things. Uh, you know, this group, Cadre, we didn't have our objectives up. We kind of talked about them, but they aren't showing. It's always good to have something written up there, you know, a plan. And uh, if I can try to do this, share my screen and go to that, but I got to take her off. Oh, nope, don't want to do that. Okay. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one here. Sorry. Okay. That's not working. Here we go. Okay, at some point, uh, as an instructor and as a student, screen sharing is stopped as the shared window is closed. I didn't, did anyone see a PowerPoint from me just recently? Very yeah, briefly. Okay, yeah, well, somehow it closed automatically. I don't know how to do this stuff. So if we go into a classroom, any one of us are leading a group or we're seeing people, we make eye contact, you say, who's next? Someone raise a hand, you make eye contact and everyone, everyone in the class sees you making eye contact, that person starts to speak. Online, people just start to speak. If you have more than 16 people or whatever the matrix, whatever the matrix on my screen is, unless you have that speaker pop up, you don't know who it is. So student expectations can be on an online environment, they have to say your name first. Like Steve started to speak just a moment ago. I did not recognize his voice. I was like, who's speaking? And because I had the speaker. So we have these classroom expectations of instructors versus students. Students are not supposed to be playing on their phone. Students are not supposed to be sleeping. Uh, students are not supposed to be gazing out the window or at a certain opposite gender people walking down the hall. So those are expectations, but you don't see that online. So you have to come up with us. This will appear, but there'll be a student code of, code of conduct. And you have to, you can make up your own. I have mine and I was just trying to find, I'm a hockey official. I have been for many, 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 many years. I have to take an online seminar today. I'll be asleep for sure. But right there, student expectations. You'll be seated at a computer, not using a phone. You will have audio and you'll be on mute, but you will be able to unmute. The onus upon participation is upon the user. Okay, so if they call me and I don't answer, I suppose they may not give me my uh, cer certificate this year. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this because I've got my minutes there, but you need to have video on. I need to be able to see everybody. If you have cards, they have to be pre-printed. Folks should be muted if they aren't speaking. Just a little fan. I have a fan here because my office air conditioning is a fan and this open window. 
that makes noise. So people should mute and you just gotta get used to muting and unmuting. If you have the background up like Beth does, if she was using cards, sometimes they don't show up because that auto focuses. You as a student, student code of conduct must uh, minimize background noise. You'll focus on course content. Um, ben took one of those classes that uh, he was speaking about and there was somebody who was taking the class while dispatching. She had it on mute, but that was just, you could just tell. That was ridiculous, okay? Uh, replies of students will be clear, concise, and brief. Because just as in a classroom when some know-it-all wants to talk the whole time, that gets old. So I have more, but as an instructor, get across what you're, you need to in these initial stages of online learning get the student code of conduct or expectations because what we're used to in the classroom does not necessarily apply. Amanda? Great, thanks Dave. Um, so when we first advertised this course, we did say it would end at 11.30 Eastern, but then we thought people might have some questions and might wanna stick around. So we are gonna wrap up formally, but you are more than welcome to stick around and ask more questions of each other, of, of us as instructors. Um, in the final thoughts here, I'm wondering um, if people could just take a moment, if you have some aha moment or something that you took out of this last three hours on Zoom, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Dave, I'll, I'm jumping right in. Apologies, someone just started to speak, but in my final class, I, fi I had a class list of people in order, and I would say, now it's time for the AAR, the aha moment. We're gonna start at the bottom. So Karen Zuckley had to go first, that's Z-U-E. And so that's the way we got through everybody to speak. But these aha moments will be as good for the instructors as they will be for you. So just trying to help Amanda along here, but everyone speaks, please, your aha moment. I'm gonna throw this. This is Al. Um, I like the cards I had never thought about you know, actually having cards pre-printed, you know, like we're you showing the A, you know, those are things that you could actually print up and email to the students and just have them cut out and they're all ready to go. That's, we're definitely gonna utilize that one. Thanks Al, who's next or I pick? Raise your hand or put up your name Where's my name card here? Put up your name and just go, go ahead, Zach. Well, I shared it in the chat window, but um, I, I've been amazed that there are actually some trainings that are more suited to online and actually the experience would be better online than it would be in person because of these multiple tools that, that you have demonstrated with the ability to switch um, to different platforms and different media formats. Um, so in the classroom, I've seen that come across really clunky, but it, it almost seems um, better online. So um, I, that was a huge surprise to me. That's my aha moment is that um, sometimes these on tra online trainings can be even more valuable than they were in person. And I didn't expect that. So. Hey, Zach, I saw that in the chat when it came up. Uh, can you share specifically which classes you thought were better online? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I've, I've been um, attending a lot of webinars. So not actually NWCG classes, but those webinars that are having guest speakers and um, just the ability to have uh, high definition video and switch seamlessly from one presenter to the other. Um, I, I know not everybody has access to that kind of bandwidth, but here in Las Vegas we do. And it's been almost, the interactive experience has been almost like better than in person because you don't have to smell somebody's breath or, you know, there's not that environmental thing. You're able to control your environment. And um, that part to me has been beneficial. Thanks. I have an aha. Lindsay. Uh, I, you know, Virginia, when you sent out the content that we'd be going over S212 Chainsaw, and I'm going, oh, I, was, I was skeptical of, you know, would this content really be relatable through the virtual setting? And I see how it can. Um, so I came in with a reservation about, um, you know, what appropriate content is is appropriate for, for virtual delivery. And um, my aha, I guess, is that through the creativity, yeah, we can definitely make it 
make it do. Of course, nothing takes the place of field experience, but for the actual coursework, yeah, it's suitable. Thanks, Lindsay. Matt's up. I, I had an aha moment when I, uh, earlier this year, when I had to uh, uh, reconfigure a bunch of material that a colleague of mine and I had developed for in-person training delivery, uh, and, and we had to completely 180 it and, and start to deliver things online, and we elected to, to record lectures and, do, and deliver these uh, lectures asynchronously. And one of the, what we found was that you can't try to teach PowerPoint online and record it like you, or from PowerPoint online and record it as I normally would in a classroom. You know, uh, I have a tendency to riff a lot and ask a lot of questions and work real interactively. And what we found was we had to script things incredibly tightly if we were going to record them and have them land with any kind of gravitas. Uh, so I'd just like to reinforce that teaching point that you guys brought up. If you're gonna try to deliver stuff in a recorded format, it's got to be really, really well scripted. And it's worthwhile to try to learn some sound and video editing, which I never thought I'd do. Great, Matt, here we go, who's up? Thomas has his hand up. I'm so Thomas. Someone yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. so I think my aha moment is um, I taught my first virtual fire refresher last week, and it was mainly YouTube and PowerPoint. And I think my aha moment is that it doesn't have to be just YouTube and PowerPoints to get through these trainings. I think we've got the technology to do some really cool things. I think embracing that technology and trying to make it more interactive is definitely the, the way forward. Thanks, Tom. How about Franny? Your aha moment, Franny? Am I Franny? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, I, my apologies. No problem. Um, yeah, I was skeptical. I had the same about the chainsaw, chainsaw um, class. I was really wondering, what are we going to see with the chainsaw on, <laughs> on the screen? Um, so yeah, that um, I agree. I think um, we have so much possibility with just being creative and using tools, you know, like papers, just showing things with your hand, just talking and making, preparing videos before doing online classes or whatever we can imagine that make things actually interactive and easy to follow and not boring or, and still have, you know, the experience that not same as in the field, but getting um, enough visuals to be able to understand everything. So I was very surprised and thank you for that. Well, thank you. How about Rick? Probably echo a lot of fan, what Fanny said. Uh, her and I work in a non-English speaking environment generally. So I'm excited about the creativity that and the flexibility of this. And, um, and I'd just like to shout out to the, the cadre and everyone that put this together, excellent job of putting this together for us. There are many aha moments for me. So uh, being an old school kind of guy, I thought, how could this possibly work? It's so obvious that we can be extremely creative now. And thank goodness that we've decoupled ourselves from the tyranny of PowerPoint. Very good observation. How about Fred and then Scott? Fred, I think you're on mute. Fix that. Yeah, Fred Turk here. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, um, I think the thing I got out of this is like with any technology, you have to uh, understand it. And, and I'm realizing that Zoom has a lot of capacity. It's, as I say, it's smarter than I am. Uh, and I think it has a lot of options that will allow us to be creative and flexible in the teaching environment. So um, again, exposing us to to some of its capacity is was uh, my takeaway moment thing here. 
you know, I don't, I really don't believe um, that online is, is going to be better than a traditional. I think it fills the gap and it, it shows that we have options to continue our training uh, environment when we get handed uh, um, some challenges like we are currently. But uh, I, I think we got some real potential here. Thank you. Okay, Scott, and then Beth, if you haven't gone, you'll be next. Scott? Yeah, I think one of the aha moments today is uh, the uh, backup plan on what happens when internet, internet connectivity fails. Uh, and usually I pride myself on having my system stripped down pretty good so that I just really have that connectivity at the highest level. And so I'm not sure what was going on, although I did see a four service uh, uh, download occurring. So probably, you know, my system got hijacked to some degree. And so I think uh, that backup plan ahead of time and that testing that that your cod, that the cadre did yesterday, going through it so that people know that if somebody has to drop, what uh, to move on. And I want to just echo on what Fred just mentioned too about, you know, that in-person training. One of the things that we're looking at is how do we morph this so that some of our coursework might be internet or virtually de delivered, but then we reduce, you know, and reduce that five day down to maybe a two day in session where we're really more focused on say a simulation piece. So we're doing some of that other side stuff outside of that. We can reduce then the in-person piece a little bit so that it's more streamlined and more, maybe more conducive in this uh, COVID-19 environment. Thanks, Scott. So Beth and then Jack, and then we'll do the instructors. Okay. So um, as an introvert, I would have expected that this would have been a horrible experience for me these past three hours, and it hasn't been. I've actually really enjoyed myself and surprised myself by how much I've talked. Um, so <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't know if it's because of the small class size. I mean, 16 is great, you know, and like, like, like somebody said, you know, we can fit all 16 on and, and see everybody at once and you don't feel overwhelmed by the class size. Um, maybe it helps that I already knew four people in the class, but I'm thinking that um, something else that really helped me was boom, going right into one of those breakout groups where I actually knew two of the people in the breakout group, I, I, I don't know, but, but just, just um, maybe giving me as an introvert the chance to work in a small group right off the bat just kind of increased the comfort level with, um, you know, potentially all 15 of you are staring at me right now. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, anyway, I, I really like the breakouts. I've never done that before. And I didn't know how those would work. I was really skeptical, but that was fantastic. And yeah, two thumbs up to you guys. This, this was a really great training. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Zach, then uh, Ben. Sorry, Jack, not Zach. <laughs> Can't read. Jack, you're up. Yep, I'm unmuting. I didn't hear my name tone. Um, so I've been uh, helping uh, implement and teach RX310 and other courses, NWCG courses at universities um, for probably about five years now. Um, I took this, signed up for this as a student and then Amanda in Virginia kind of wrote me in to help. So it's been, and I was taking it because of trying to look for all the tips and there's a lot here. Um, practice, practice, practice. And, you know, again, we, it, it takes just as much to set up an online version as it does an in-person, but obviously there's, there's nuances. I don't know that online is any better or any worse. It depends how you do it. It is what we have to do. Um, at the university level for students, we go through the same thing with student expectations, um, student code of conduct, making sure there's enough breaks, making sure that there's you know, not PowerPoint, you know, um, or very limited PowerPoint and a lot of hands-on and a lot of interaction. Um, but there's a lot of really good tips with this to do. The advantage that I've seen um, from this and from doing the university trainings is the ability to bring in virtual instructors from everywhere. Um, you have to make sure you use practice sessions with, which, with each of those 
And whether we're doing an intense, you know, two day course or we're doing it across a semester, you know, you just opened up your range of different cadre. Um, and it, for the university students, it's really made a huge difference to hear from people, you know, across the country um, and from different countries too. So, um, but yeah, this is, uh, I applaud Amanda and Virginia. Um, this has been amazing. And I'm, I know there's two more of these to go and you, you know, I don't think you're gonna end there because this is a need um, you're filling big time. Thanks, Jack. Ben, and then uh, Virginia and Amanda will finish it up. Um, some of the things that I take away from helping instruct this class is, I, I think somebody, I think it was Fred mentioned that this will never take the place of um, live in-person classes. But having been someone that has taken two of these virtual classes, and I took those two classes inside of a month's time, I wouldn't have been able to do that with a live in-person class with the travel and, you know, just other things going on in my life. Um, even when we come out of the pandemic and virtual training isn't a necessity, this isn't going away anytime. You know, people are going to use this and the advantages that come with virtual training. And uh, Jack just mentioned, you know, getting instructors from all over the country, if not the world, to come into a virtual classroom and teach. Um, that's a very useful tool. So this is something that a lot of people are going to have to start getting used to. And I believe the virtual training is also a good bridge from the gap of in-person training to online classes. Like, you know, for those in the fire community, we all know that S290 is an online class as well. And a lot of instructors will like lose their mind about the fact that S290 is a online class and it should be taught in person only. Well, this is a pretty good bridge to that. You know, I can see how a lot of these tools that we learned in this training can be used in a class like that. So that's, my two cents. Thanks, Ben. Now, uh, my applause for Amanda and Virginia for spearheading the whole thing, which they did. So here we go, everybody. And uh, Amanda, you have an agenda for the next 15 minutes for those who want, but you and Virginia have the, uh, the, 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 the final uh, aha say here. Go ahead. I think, um, I, I want to thank everybody uh, for being part of it. We're all in a, as we've been saying, unprecedented situation. We've been using that word too much, um, but uh, it's been great to get to spend time with all of you. I agree with everything that all of you have said for highlights and opportunities. Um, I, uh, I've been seeing good messages in the chat box about how do we keep this going? So one of the silver linings or the ahas for me is this is a really good team and we have two more classes with even more really good teams to follow. Um, this, there's an opportunity here to keep this cadre, all 16 of us, connected um, to help make more NWCG courses accessible um, as we continue. So we'll be in touch uh, with how, to, how we can keep in touch. Um, but I'm, I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to meet all of you today. I think Virginia has some next steps. And another really big thank you to our, our cadre of instructors for allowing your arms to be twisted and for sharing your wisdom. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, I just want to quickly say that my aha moment is that I feel like I was the tech person today. I'm wearing a gaming headset, so I look like the tech person, certainly. Um, I started my science communication career about five years ago, and I did not have any training like this before I started. So my aha moment is that everything I presented you today is a uh, second nature to me now. And so once y'all start doing this for yourselves, you will get to be where I am. It's not like I have any special brain power. It's just that I've done it a ton because it's my career now. So once you make this a part of your career, you will feel this comfortable with it too. So good job, everyone. Thank you for participating. You can do it. Um, we do still have some open slots in our uh, second and third workshops that where we'll be running something similar. So if you have friends or colleagues or somebody that you think would like this kind of training, please send them to us. We have an interest list going now because registration is closed, but we'll be assessing who signs up and why they say they're interested as we go. Um, if you want to pass on anything that you've learned here today, uh, if you feel like anyone you know has a need and you feel empowered, then please do that. And then we would love it if you tell us about it. That helps us justify these kinds of workshops and spending our time on it and helps us know whether we need to 
do this all the time every month till COVID is done or whether our need is done. Um, so we'd also just love to have that positive interaction with you here. You brag on yourself and uh, be your cheerleaders back to you. So if you spread what you've learned here today, please do let us know. Um, we will be deciding how much time we can spend offering more of these workshops in the future. So again, have people sign up for our interest list. Uh, if there's huge interest, we'll see what we can do. Um, I want to end uh, with a break for everyone who'd like to stick around and discuss more. Um, I will be in touch with email, uh, by email to give you a recording of this, to give you a resource list. And again, please feel free to share the Google Docs that we've given you, the resources we've already given you, and then this recording once it's done. Um, so I'm going to say we're going to go to a quick break. Anybody who wants to stick around for Q&A, uh, please do. If you don't have time, don't have capacity, just need a break yourself for real, then thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I will be in touch later. Um, this was lovely. Again, break time. Thank you. See some of you again in like, let's say three minutes or so, or whenever you feel like coming back, I'll be sticking around. Amanda, anything else to add or is that good? I All think right. we're good, everybody. Okay. Bye and see you soon.